Hello, everybody. Happy Monday. I hope you all had a fantastic weekend and you're here hanging out with me today. I apologized uh, for the momentary lateness. I am not, in fact, time blind, guys. I know what time it is. We had a whole different show planned for you today. But then this whole hit piece from The New Yorker came out about Andrew Huberman. So we've shifted gears. We're going to go through this supposed hit piece and go through some of the details. I tried to read as much of this as possible before the show, but we're just going to go through it together because uh, that's the way we do things on this stream. You guys will probably be familiar with Andrew Huberman. He's a Stanford researcher who's known best for his podcast Huberman Lab, where he talks about the research that he's doing. He brings on different experts to talk to you about anything from uh, how to get the best dopamine during the day to how we deal with alcoholism and smoking. What's the best way to live? What's the best nighttime routine? How do we practice gratitude? All these different questions Huberman asks himself in his Huberman Lab podcast and tries to give you, uh, shall we say, the best prescription on what you can do in your own life, or at the very least, going through the research. Now, there's been a hit piece published on him in The New Yorker, but before we get into that and to discuss all these different things, we have Taylor in Nashville. Hey, hey, yeah, happy Monday, and yeah, cue the breaking news music and supposedly the dramatic uh, music, and since we are springing into action to cover this breaking story about this hit piece. Yeah. I, don't play with me, New Yorker, okay? If you're going to publish a hit piece on somebody, we all know this is what happens, right? You start your podcast or you write your book or whatever endeavor it is you're working on, you rise to fame, and then all of a sudden there's like an expose on you and everything horrible you've ever done in your life. And apparently <laughs> this is what's happening with Huberman. Now, I don't know how valid these things are going to be. I don't know how shocking they are going to be, but we are going to learn about it here today. Do any of you guys listen to Huberman Lab? Are you fans of Andrew Huberman? I've watched many of his videos. I've watched YouTubers who implement his morning routine and his lifestyle stuff that he recommends. You'll know him probably pretty famously for being the guy who tells you to wake up in the morning, go outside and get a few minutes of sunlight every day to sort of jumpstart your brain, get a good dopamine hit, stay away from the phone and the candy and the junk food and all these different things. He's done many a talk of cold plunges and sauna. He's been on Joe Rogan a ton of times. There's, uh, there's tons uh, where this this guy's face has been seen. I even went to see Andrew Huberman when he did a show, shall we call it, here in LA. He did like a little live talk that you could go to and a, a friend had gifted us tickets. So my boyfriend and I, we went and watched Andrew Huberman live. It was about the same stuff that you get out of his podcast. But now we have this article. So let me let me stop. We'll, we'll just actually go through this together. and we can, we can read some here. It says, Andrew Huberman's Mechanisms of Control, the private and public seductions of the world's biggest pop neuroscientist. <laughs> That'll give you a big head. The world's biggest pop neuroscientist. Now, this is written by Carrie Howley, uh, a, a features writer for New York Magazine since 2021. So I've read some of this, as I said before. The article really starts out talking about Andrew Huberman's come up, you know, all the different work that he's done, how he was a little boy in a family and, you know, he wasn't super happy growing up. He struggled with a lot in life. One of the main points being that he struggled with his parents' divorce and that sort of led him down the pathway to therapy. And whilst he was in therapy, he sort of noticed the joys and wonders of having experienced therapy and that had, had piqued his interest in some way, shape or form, which is why he does feature many a therapist on on his show. It goes through the fact that he started this podcast that did deep dives into some of the, you know, minutia in our life that we wouldn't think needs needs or has research behind it, but Huberman decided to look into it. It paints him out as a, a workhorse who really wanted to dedicate his time to research and sharing what he found in his podcast. It says here. Which real quick, it's worth mentioning, by yeah. the way, I just want to throw this in there that I just looked it up. His podcast is like top 10, top 11 podcasts in the entire entire world according to Spotify's chart. So this is, if you're not familiar with Andrew Huberman, he's a big deal in the uh, non-mainstream media world. Yes. And maybe that has to do with why they might be going after him here as well. But I just wanted to give that a little bit more context as well, that he's yeah. a very, very big name in the podcasting world. I did have to think about that. I, I, at first, I'm like, why would somebody want to make a hit piece against Andrew Huberman? What is he doing that the mainstream media wouldn't necessarily like? I don't have an answer for that quite yet. 
Um, but maybe you guys can can think of some. He's, Get your tinfoil hats out. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly been platformed by, and I guess platforms in return, people who are not well liked by the mainstream media. Joe Rogan is uh, one of the, the many there. But his content is pretty tame, if you're familiar with Huberman Lab and what he puts out. So maybe it's just the benefit of taking like a megastar and maybe taking them down a few notches. I yeah. did just see this comment from Grateful One in the chat, and he said, uh, Huberman backs up common sense with neuroscience without constantly pushing pharmaceuticals. Of course, they want to discredit him. So Whoa. here come the tinfoil takes. But, uh, <laughs> Where's my hat? You know, there, there might be a there there. <laughs> there might, it might be there. But let's get through some of this article and see what, we, see what we get to. Okay, of course, in the beginning, they are painting the picture of who he is. It says millions of people feel compelled to hear him draw distinctions between neuromodulators and classic neurotransmitters. Many of those people will then adopt adopt an associated protocol. They will follow his elaborate morning routine. They will model the most basic functions of human life, sleeping, eating, seeing on his sober advice. They will tell their friends to do the same. He's not like other other bro podcasters, they will say, and they will be correct. He is a tenured Stanford professor associated with the Stanford lab. He knows the difference between a neuromodulator and a neurotransmitter. He is just back sold from a sold out tour in Australia where he filled the Sydney Opera House. Stanford at one point hung signs saying authorized personnel only, apparently to deter fans in search of his lab. So Clearly, they're painting the picture of this sort of mega popular man who's managed to rise to fame in an arena that is not typical uh, when it comes to rising to fame. Not many people want to hear about neuromodulators and neurotransmitters and uh, get somebody to display the distinction between those two things. But Huberman managed to strike that chord. Now, they uh, describe him as like a mid 40s, super jacked, attractive guy in this article, which I guess is true. If you've seen Huberman uh, do his little campaign run lift shoot thing uh where they go up a mountain he is he's pretty jacked <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm man secure enough in my masculinity to admit that he is an attractive man even uh, with this silver gray beard not that i'm you know i'm trying to emulate him here or anything but uh yeah, he's got some going on for sure yeah well, so let's read further it says with this power comes the power to lift other scientists out of their narrow silos and turn them too into celebrities but these scientists will not be huberman whose personal appeal is distinct he here we have a broad-minded professor, puppyishly enamored with the wonders of biological function, generous to interviewees, quote, I love to be wrong, end quote, engaged in endearing attempts to sound like a normal person. Quote, now we all have to eat, and it's nice to eat foods that we enjoy. I certainly do that. I love food, in fact, end quote. <laughs> okay. So it's funny because when you read into this article, it seemed... It seemingly is just a really well-written article. I always like to look into some of the fun things that they're doing with language to paint a, a certain picture. And the picture so far that I'm getting is that Huberman is like this bachelory 40-year-old workhorse who is not normal in the fact that he's attractive and popular and you know engaging with a niche, but tries to come off as normal to sort of place himself in the same position as other people. But I've yet to hear an accusation being made throughout this article. Now, they go through some more to explain, you know, where he's at in life, who he's interviewing, people like Peter Atia, who has, uh, I think, been featured on the show many a time. They discuss the fact that Huberman has been in therapy since high school and that he's seen several therapists and that he's found this to be really helpful for his mental health. And they go through more and more of that. And they talk about how he's gone through many self-revelations. He must give his story a shape that ultimately tends towards inner strength, weakness overcome. For Andrew Huberman to become your teacher and mine, as he very much uh, was for a period this fall, a period in which I diligently absorbed sun uh, upon waking, drink no more than once a week, practice physiological size in traffic, and said to myself out loud in my living room, I also... I also love mechanism, a period which, oh, sorry, a period during which I began to think seriously for the first time in my life about reducing stress and during which both my husband and my young child saw tangible benefit from repeatedly immersing ourselves in frigid water. So this writer is saying, I listened to Andrew Huberman. I took on a lot of his advice. Now, <laughs> 
<laughs> this this uh, paragraph is interesting. Huberman sells a dream of control down to the cellular level, but something has gone wrong. In the midst of immense fame, a chasm is opened between the podcaster preaching dopaminergic restraints and a man with newfound wealth, with access to a world unseen by most professors. The problem with a man always working on himself is that he may also be working on you. Ooh, spooky, spooky. What's that movie with Christian? Bale, where he's like a little psycho serial killer. What's the name of that film? <laughs> Why is it escaping me? Is that American Psycho? American Psycho. That's the vibe that I'm getting from this article so far, that Huberman is like this psychotic older guy who wakes up in the morning and drenches himself in sunlight before hopping in a cold plunge, and then he goes to work in his lab. So again, we're wondering, what are the accusations here? We're going to get into them. They start to express that... Uh, Huberman's love life. They start talking about this woman by the name of Sarah. And we're going to read a little bit about Sarah by this wonderful writer, Carrie, who is, you know, she's doing a good job painting a picture here. She says, by then he had a partner, Sarah, which is not her real name. Sarah was someone who could talk to anyone about anything. She was dewy and strong and in her mid forties, though she looked a decade younger with two small kids from a previous relationship. She had old friends who adored her and no trouble making new ones. She came across as scattered in the way that she jumped readily from topic to topic in conversation, losing the thread before returning to it. But she was in fact extremely organized. She was a woman who kept track of things. She was an entrepreneur who could organize a meeting, a skill. She she would need later for reasons she could not possibly have predicted. When I asked her a question in her home recently, she said the answer would be on an old phone. She stood up, left for a moment, and returned with a box labeled old phones. Now, apparently, Sarah's relationship with Andrew Huberman started in 2018 in the Bay Area, where they both lived. He had found her on Instagram, messaged her. They started to hang out. Homegirl was interested in Mr. Huberman. And apparently, this became a devoted relationship relationship where they devoted themselves to healthy living, exercise, good food, good information. They cared about their bodies. They cared uh, about just taking care of one another. And she describes herself as becoming very doting during her relationship with Andrew Huberman, that suddenly she was like making him food and tending to the kitchen and all these different things. And she would express this to her friends and her friends would say, Sarah, that doesn't sound like you to take care of a man. And I guess her friends had been a little suspicious that maybe Andrew was creating problems with her and turning her into something that she's not. Now, when it gets into arguments that her and Andrew Huberman may have had, Apparently, according to Sarah, he was very upset about her past relationships and the past men that she had been with. She says, quote, I experienced his rage, end quote. And this was apparently in reference to the, the topic of the fact that she had two prior children. Uh, she states that he was particularly upset about the second child, although uh, a spokesperson on behalf of Andrew Huberman says that this is a lie. I'm going to immediately ask. Why do I care? Why are we talking about this girl that he has a personal relationship with that started in 2018 and is now leading us into, you know, years further from that? Why do I care? And what does this have to do with listening to Huberman Lab or taking in the information that he's stating on his podcast of waking up and taking in sunlight or, you know, doing the cold plunge in the sauna or whatever the case may be for the information that you're taking in? So far, I have no idea what this has to do with the story. Now, then it goes on to say, on Thanksgiving in 2018, Sarah had planned to introduce Andrew to her parents and close friends. She was cooking, she was getting everything ready, and Andrew texted her that he was going to be late. Oh my goodness. And apparently this went on and on until he was going to be running hours late. And then, of course, all of these things were planned around his arrival and he just kept going, quote, oh, I'm gonna be late. And then it's the night, it's the end of the night and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry that this happened. <laughs> okay, again, is so far the accusation is he dated a girl and now she's doting on him and now he's like late to things and doesn't care about other people's time. You would think we were gonna get more than this. This article then goes on 
to explain Andrew Huberman's habits when it comes to meeting people on time and like valuing their time and respecting their time. It says Huberman disappearing was something of a pattern. Friends, girlfriends, and colleagues describe him as hard to reach. The list of reasons for not showing up included a book timestamping the podcast, Costello, uh, wildfires, and a meetings tunnel. He is flaky and doesn't respond to things, says his friend Brian McKenzie. And then we go through this whole few pages about different times where he's flaked, where he said he was going to be somewhere where he, in fact, was was not there. Yes, the New Yorker is dedicating their time to telling you that he flaked on meeting with his friends. But don't worry, guys. The plot thickens and uh, we do indeed find out more. They go more into the arguments that he would have with Sarah over her past relationships and the fixation that he apparently had on her having had previous children in a relationship. They talk about an argument that he got into with a friend who had written a book and wanted him to review some of the material in the book that spoke about Andrew Huberman and things that he had said or researched. He had emailed him several times. Hey, Andrew, I need you to check this out. Andrew didn't get back. Emailed him again. Hey, Andrew, I need you to check this out. He didn't get back. Emailed him one last time and said, you know what? I'm going to finalize this if you don't get back to me and look through the research that I've placed in this book. And finally, I guess he gets a call from Andrew Huberman and Andrew Huberman explodes on him on the phone. How dare you, you know, start publishing these things and it becomes this whole vitriolic thing. And the guy says, I'd never had... You know, somebody who I've respected in research or a colleague go off on me in this way. I'm sorry. <laughs> what does this have to do with Andrew Huberman and Huberman Lab and listening to that podcast? I get it. He sounds a little shitty in his personal life. What does that have to do with me? And why are you as a journalist going out of your way to research this stuff, writing like a fluff piece where you paint him out to be actually like a psycho? And then printing that out for the world to view. What is your goal here in creating this article? And what do you hope that people do in the wake of reading this article? Are we going to say, I'm not going to listen to Huberman Lab and the research that he is bringing to us and the experts that he's bringing to us because he treated his girlfriend bad and he yelled at a supposed friend on the phone and he's flaky? <laughs> I don't right. get this, it. This is why it, you, we're calling it a hit piece because that is exactly how you do a hit piece. You don't talk to the person themselves. You call the ex-girlfriend. You call the guy that got yelled at on the phone. And maybe what are probably some of his worst moments that he would probably like to clarify, dispute, and or express regret or apologize for. But no, no, no. Let's just construct this narrative and this is this problem like there's there's a long history in magazines like rolling stone and the new yorker of having this type of journalism where you do this like very like lengthy in-depth profile and you go into the inner workings of their lives and you try to like paint a picture but traditionally when you're painting a a picture of a person's life in a profile you want to do them justice and you take the long swaths of paragraphs of text and digging deep into their life to try to bring that person to life and and show a side of them that you wouldn't necessarily see uh, from an everyday perspective. But this is all done seemingly with a specific intent of trying to frame the, the facts of his life in a certain way and paint him uh, in a certain way so as to presumably undercut his work or his credibility in some way. But no matter how many attacks we keep hearing, they don't actually connect or have any bearing on the primary focus of what he does, which is offer like science backed information on his podcast. And that's why people care about him. So to go after him for all these reasons, it just you can't help but feel like, why are they doing this? It just feels like a hit piece. Yeah, it does feel like they already knew what the intention of the article was going to be before they structured the article. So they just needed to find pieces of information that made him look bad to inject into the article so that they could post it out to people and hopefully, I guess, get you to stop watching Huberman Lab. Of course, the, the plot thickens. OK, so it says in August, of 2021, Sarah says she read Andrew's journal and discovered a reference to cheating. She was, she says, gutted. I hear you are, I hear you are saying you are angry and hurt, he texted her the same day. I will hear you as much as long as needed for us. 
Andrew and Sarah wanted children together, Sarah states. Optimizers uh, sometimes prefer not to conceive naturally. One can exert more control when procreation involves a lab. Sarah began the first of several rounds of IVF. So here's another picture they're trying to paint. Well, first of all, if he cheated on her, that sucks. You sound like a pretty horrible boyfriend, not a cool thing to go through. Again, how does it affect the research that I'm listening to on your two hour podcast? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how that it all affects me as the listener, but I get it. I feel bad for you. And I certainly wouldn't date somebody who, uh, who does that to their previous partners. And that'd be somebody who I'd stay away from. What does it have to do with me? Now this girl undergoes IVF, apparently out of a, of a mutual decision to do so. And again, they're trying to paint out this American psycho type character by saying one can exert more control over procreation when it involves a lab. I'm sorry, a ton of people choose to engage in IVF every single day. And presumably these two individuals are in their, you know, Huberman's in his 40s. I believe Sarah's also in her, her 40s. Wouldn't it kind of make sense to be going down the route of IVF? Why are you trying to make it out as if he's trying to exert control over her by having her do IVF? Very strange. And this is why we have to break down the language that is used in these articles, because they're so often trying to paint a certain picture for you. Now, throughout this article, as they're detailing the cheating that this woman discovers that Andrew Huberman is engaging in, they weave in episodes of his podcast so that you guys get the view that he is using his podcast and the experts that he talks to in order to expand his knowledge of therapy and then use it to manipulate the woman that he's in a relationship with. Now, I don't know if that's true or false. I'm just telling you what this article says. It says here, quote, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about truth telling and deception, Andrew told evolutionary psychologist David Buss on a November 2021 episode of Huberman Lab called How Humans Select and Keep Romantic Partners in Short and Long Term. They were talking about regularities across cultures in mate preferences. Quote, could you tell us, end quote, Andrew asked, quote, about how men and women leverage deception versus truth telling and communicating some of the things around mate's, uh, mate's choice selection? Then uh, the expert says effective tactics tactics for men are often displaying cues to long-term interest. Men tend to exaggerate the depths of their feeling for a woman. Andrew says, let's talk about infidelity in committed relationships. I'm guessing it does happen. The expert says men who have affairs tend to have affairs with a larger number of affair partners and so which sorry and so which then by definition can't be long lasting. You can't have long term affairs with six different partners. OK, so clearly they're trying to say Andrew's having conversations about infidelity and cheating and deception with experts and the experts are giving the knowledge that he then uses against these women. But what I actually find quite hilarious is that if we are listening to the podcast and juxtaposing that with Andrew's life, where he is cheating on this woman with multiple women, it only reinforces that the research that they're giving you on the podcast is correct. <laughs> So if the researcher says, you know, men typically have a ton of romantic partners when they're cheating and they're not long lasting and, you know, he'll cheat multiple times on the same woman and Andrew Huberman's going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, knowing damn well that that's right about his own life, then the research that you're getting on Huberman Lab uh, is seemingly accurate. <laughs> it actually... I just gotta yeah, uh, go I'm for sorry. it. I just got to read here real quick. You guys are going crazy in the chat. Like they're mocking how silly some of these lines of attack are on him. And they're uh -huh. saying, does he also leave the toilet seat up? Did he forget to put the <laughs> twist tie back on the bread? Does he take the trash out and not put a replacement bag in it? What a horrible <laughs> human. You know? Yeah, it's like, OK, I get it. These are not things that I would want to deal with in my personal life coming from a partner. But what does this have to do with his credibility as a scientist and a researcher? It really doesn't. And it feels like you what happened was you got together a bunch of bitter women 
to come and give you a ton of information and you thought, well, since I don't have any actual credible arguments to discredit what he's doing on a day to day basis, I'm going to try to knock him down a peg by bringing up affairs that he's had and people who he's cheated with. And they do find things. So, I mean, that's that's very clear. Now, how that changes your judgment of somebody that you're going to for research and information about your your life, I don't know. If I was going to a doctor to help cure a, a disease or help with symptoms that I'm experiencing, I don't sit down with the doctor and say, how's your relationship with your wife? And how often have you have you cheated on her? I go to the doctor, I get the information that I know he's hopefully knowledgeable on, and I go home and I implement that in my life. It has nothing to do with what the doctor's doing in his personal time. And the fact that just because you gain popularity, somebody can go and insert themselves into your life like this and air out your dirty laundry, it's insane. Now, mind you, what he did to this woman, to these women, if true, is not okay. But damn, do y'all want all your dirty laundry aired out as soon as you become popular because somebody likes your podcast? That's crazy, crazy. Yeah, and it, it just seems beneath uh, an institution that is supposedly supposed to be like a respectable journalistic outlet like The New Yorker to be using their resources to go after him in this way, which again, if there were legitimate reasons to doubt his credibility, as a neuroscientist, as a voice in the public who is espousing information, then let's hear them. But to just go after his personal life, it's just it, you're reducing yourself to like a gossip rag, you know, instead of being an, a serious journalistic outlet. And one, one other thought is we talk all the time on the show about just how difficult it is to sift through all the abundance of information that is out there right now, especially in sort of the post-COVID BLM era where so many institutions uh, just through their credibility by the wayside with a lot of Americans, a lot of people worldwide where we aren't sure, we're still hearing, it seems like every week, the new information that arises where different institutions are saying, well, we were actually wrong about this treatment or we were wrong about that uh, when we, we did the lockdowns or whatever. And little by little, they're expressing regret for things that were imposed at the time. And so pe people have a reason to doubt the credibility of so many in institutions. And in the wake of that, you have podcasters like uh, Huberman who have taken the approach of saying, I'm only going to tell you things that uh, I can back up with research. I'm going to talk to credible researchers and we're, I don't have an agenda here. I'm not trying to sell you pharmaceuticals like someone said earlier in the chat. I mean, obviously, like he's a successful podcaster, he's making money off it. But that comes with earning people's trust uh, because the institutions have abdicated their responsibility to maintain people's trust. And it seems to me like a lot of what can be motivating the animus against Huberman on the part of mainstream media journalistic institutions is their desire to have a monopoly on narratives, their desire to have a monopoly on the truth and what is right. acceptable information. So you see someone like him gaining a lot of traction and attention. And they're like, oh, no, we don't want people listening to him. We want them to only be listening to us. A hundred percent. That's what they just want to discredit anything that falls outside of the mechanisms of control that they have, which is so funny because this whole article is meant to accuse Andrew Huberman of having like this psychotic need for control over his work life and the girls that he's with. And he tells lies in order to make that control, you know, uh, more and more privy to him when actually what you're trying to do is control the narrative and control what people see. Now, this article dedicates one paragraph one paragraph to AG1 Greens, which if you guys watch Huberman Lab, you know that he's sponsored by AG1 Greens, Athletic Greens, where it's like a little green drink powder that you can like drink in the morning and it's supposed to be full of vitamins and probiotics or whatever. Now, this one paragraph talks about the possible problem that most of the probiotics in the AG1 greens are not concentrated enough to actually colonize, which is an interesting assertion. If you're listening to a researcher and he's telling you that you should buy AG1 greens and then you purchase uh, AG1 greens and they're actually not effective, maybe that's what you should have dedicated the article to. The, the research that you go to for your morning routine and night routine is sponsored by something that actually isn't effective. I don't know whether or not that's true. That's clearly the assertion that they're trying to make in this article, but they only give it one paragraph and they probably only give it one paragraph because they don't have enough research to back the fact that AG1 is not good for you. So they sprinkle that in in and amongst the cheating allegations that they're accusing this man of, and then they go right back to detailing the cheating allegations. What? 
what make that make sense guys it's so weird okay so it goes on to say you know sarah had some suspicions about andrew having conversations with another woman they're still going through this process of of ivf and the ivf is not taking and while they're in this process they're cohabitating with one another they're going on trips and she she continues to say that andrew's rage was growing with cohabitation he would get more and more angry uh, at him at her and that Again, he would get upset about the fact that she had prior relationships and he had asked her to sort of detail to her all the bad decisions that she's made, including her second child, and like just regurgitate it back to him. Which again, if you're doing that with your partner, you're weird, you're a little freak. I don't know if it's true that he actually did this, but again, being a bad partner ain't got nothing to do with your research. Okay, so we're gonna keep reading. It says uh, they were on an, a camping trip apparently, uh, where Sarah noticed uh, that she and Andrew could not go out without being thronged by people. They go on this camping trip, they bring the syringes for their IVF, and at what point during this trip, uh, or sorry, later that month, Sarah decides to grab Andrew's phone uh, after uh, when he had left it in the bathroom. So she grabs the phone after he left it in the bathroom. She goes scrolling through his texts, much like she went through the journal and found the the cheating references. And she found conversations with a woman that they are going to call Eve. It's probably also not her real name. And some of them took place during the previous camping trip that they had taken. Now, clearly he's cheating on baby girl Sarah with Eve. And he says, quote, your feelings matter to Eve on a day where he had injected his girlfriend with HCG, which is for IVF, quote, I'm actually very much a caretaker, quote, I'm back on grid tomorrow and would love to see you this weekend. So she finds out that Andrew is cheating on uh, Sarah with Eve, and they get into this whole discovery. Eve's an actress. They met on Raya, blah, 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 blah. And they're having conversations. As their relationship intensified over the years, he talked often about the family that he'd one day wanted. Quote, our children would be amazing, end quote, he said. She asked for book recommendations, and he suggested jokingly, Huberman, why we made babies. Quote, I'm at the stage of life where I truly want to build a family, he told her. That's a resounding theme for me. Goes on. Now, in September of 2022, Eve noticed that Sarah was looking at her Instagram stories, not commenting or liking, just looking impulsively. Eve messaged her. Is there anything you'd rather ask me directly? She said. They set up a call. Quote, fuck you, Andrew, end quote, she messaged him. Sarah moved out in August of 2023. Okay. <laughs> does this sound like actual journalism? Or does it sound like drama that we talked about when we were 15 in high school of finding out that the boys were cheating and Sarah and Eve were both talking to Andrew at the same time? My goodness. Now, mind you, there's higher stakes in the fact that he's uh, pretending to, I guess, commit to this woman and they're going through this process of IVF. That sucks for you. Uh, and, you know, I, I wish you all the best in healing on your journey of getting over this man. But in maybe instead of talking to the New Yorker like a crazy ex who was scorned, maybe you should go deal and heal from what that man did to you because we don't need to be hearing about all this i'm sorry this is giving crazy x it really is and i know he did you wrong baby girl but <laughs> we need to let it rest because i think that'd be best okay so also she read his journal and it had references of cheating years prior okay she goes through the man's phone and she finds out that he's cheating on her What's happening between September of 2022 and August of 2023 that you're still with this man and have to move out? Why are you putting up with this behavior for, for so long and staying with a man who twice now you found out was cheating on you in some way, shape or form? This is just a question I have. Y'all are going to accuse me of victim blaming, <laughs> but I've been cheated on before. OK. And I've been there too, and I made the wrong decision too. And I blame, I, accountability, accountability. I should have left, 100%. I should have left, not even, even if I had a feeling I was being cheated on, I, I should have left. So in, in my situation, when I was with somebody, I had little, I was thinking like, oh, he's giving vibes of cheating. I never had it confirmed. I didn't have it confirmed until the relationship ended. But if you're finding out twice that somebody's cheating on you, 
Why are you staying where somebody does not want you in this situation? Anyways, they continue. More and more, she's going through this relationship. Sarah leaves his ass, apparently, or so, sorry, she doesn't leave. She moves out in August of 2023, but she remains in a committed relationship with Huberman. <laughs> So now you're just giving him the freedom to have his place back, apparently, so that he can keep bringing hoes around. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. So she moves out, and then she stays in the relationship with Andrew Huberman. It goes on and on and on. Okay. On January 11th, a woman that we'll call Alex began liking all of Sarah's Instagram posts, seven of them in one minute. Sarah messaged her saying, quote, I think you're friends with my ex, Andrew Huberman. Are you one of the women he cheated on me with? And quote alex is an intense direct highly educated woman who lives in new york she was sleeping with andrew and she had no idea that there had been a girlfriend quote fuck she said i think we should talk over the following weeks sarah and alex never stopped texting quote she helped me hold my boundary against him says sarah keep him blocked she said you need to let go of the idea of him so now we have baby girl number three we got sarah we got eve we got alex <laughs> Um, he is, he's collecting, he is collecting, he's collecting. Now, there was a day in Texas when, after Sarah left his hotel, Andrew slept with Mary. Now we got Mary, <laughs> another girl, and texted Eve. Um, okay, so we got Mary, we got Eve, I'm looking for Adam, I'm looking for Joseph, we're collecting all the biblical names in his, <laughs> in his in his sexcapade, okay? So he's racking up these girls. Anyways, they're all finding out about each other, and this whole thing is just an expose about him. Now, he would send them some of the like same text messages and same pictures, apparently. They realized on March uh, 21st of 2021, a day of admittedly impressive logical jujitsu, while Sarah was in Berkeley, Andrew had flown Mary from Texas to LA to stay with him in Topanga. While Mary was there, sitting, uh, visiting from thousands of miles away, he left her with Costello. He drove to a coffee shop where he met Eve. They had a serious talk about their relationship. <laughs> They thought they were in a good place. He wanted to make it work. Phone died, he texted Mary, who was waiting back at the place in Topanga. And later to Eve, thank you <laughs> for being so next, next level gorgeous and sexy. Sleep well, beautiful, he texted Sarah. <laughs> the scheduling alone, Alex tells me, I can barely schedule three Zooms in one day. You know what? He's a Stanford researcher. He's so used to looking at different subjects and specimen all day that he can do the same in his uh, <laughs> in his dating life. Now, mind y'all, this is already this is already aired out. That's why I'm uh, I'm reading this, but I I can't lie. I'm being entertained. I'm being entertained by this storyline and everything that is being divulged here. And I guess that mean that means I'm part of the problem because I'm the reason that somebody like the New Yorker would put out an article like this. But I don't support the messaging behind the article, right? They're trying to completely discredit this man for what he's done in his personal life. They even detail like the kind of woman that he's attracted to and why he goes after them and how the women are similar but different at the same time. And I'm not gonna read, there's more of this article to go through and read. The craziest part to me actually has nothing to do with Andrew Huberman. The girls, the ladies who are all in question here with their fake names, Alex, Mary, Sarah, Eve, whatever, they apparently found some sort of Reddit thread, I guess, where people are talking about their supposed experience with Andrew Huberman, who knows if it's real, who knows if it's fake, and they are giving themselves nicknames, they're accusing him of having a stable of hoes, okay? And these girls apparently joined this group, this online group. I don't know if it's on Reddit or, or you know, whatever a website it's on. Now, Sarah comes in at the end of the article and says, this group has radicalized me, says, there's been so much processing they are planning a weekend together in summer. They are planning a weekend together this summer. The girls that he cheated with and engaged with are planning a weekend together this summer. <laughs> Quote, it could have been sad or bitter, says Eve. We didn't jump in as besties, but real friendships have built. It has been, in a strange and unlikely way, quite a beautiful experience. Okay. So if it's been such a beautiful experience, 
What are y'all doing writing up this article trying to expose my man Andrew Huberman if he led you to your besties? That man is doing good work for you if he's leading you to your best friends. This is so strange to me, and this is a very common thing that happens when uh, men cheat, which, mind you, horrible, okay? Wouldn't recommend dating this guy after reading the article, given his uh, supposed track record with these women, although I don't know how credible these women are. Let's get that out of the way. If a man cheats on you, why are you meeting up with the girls that he cheated with for like a weekend, you know, a little ski trip? <laughs> why are you going to a resort in the summer to hang out with the girls who he cheated on you with? It's giving weird. It's giving psycho. Even though you're trying to paint him out to be the psycho, it's really strange to like build like a blood brother group with the girls who he's slept with so that you can what just like talk about him more even though you're no longer with him. It's really weird to make your entire life about the guy who cheated on you. And you should probably, you should probably move on because at some point there's somebody who did a horrible thing to you and you like heal from it and you move past it and you acknowledge it and you go, you know what? That person has their own problems. I would never be with that person again. I learned my lesson from that person. I hope he doesn't get another woman. It's different to like go and then make your whole life about it. Make all your friendships about it. Start developing resort weekends during the summer to meet up with all the other girls that he slept with so you can like talk about Andrew and detail your traumatic experiences because then you're making your life about the person who wronged you. Do you want them to have that much of a presence in your life after they've done something so wrong to you? Do you then want to make your entire life about this person who's done something wrong? And of course you have the added dig of like him becoming famous and popular and I bet that really sucks and I bet a lot more women are throwing themselves at him because of his status and where he's at with his career but let's we can be a little bitter but not too bitter I think we need to chill chill out a little bit that's all I'm gonna say <laughs> yeah Hi. it's it reminds me of like you watch these like Netflix multi-part documentaries on women who like or, you know, like a Tinder swindler or, yeah. uh, you know, in these like crazy religious cults and we're abused in the situations like that. And in that extreme circumstances, I could see, you know, wanting to maybe build camaraderie with people who've gone through the same experience to kind of like process your trauma together. But this is mostly there's some crazy elements to what they allege was how things went down and how he was juggling the women. But for the most part, it's kind of garden variety, you know, players gonna play and he's doing some some things that again are not justifiable right. are not good things to do and should not be looked on well and like you said would not recommend dating someone if they are engaging in this sort of behavior but it, it, you're not like a, a victim of a cult or like something that dramatic and it it does just s smell like you haven't moved on you haven't processed this in a healthy way or you have some need to like cling to this to get a feeling of significance about it so just a, a weird button on what is a very weird story with a lot of weird threads to it that ultimately seem to have absolutely nothing to do with uh, the credibility of Andrew Huberman and the whole time you're reading these these two details I'm like I sh I shouldn't be hearing this for the yep. like, if, if it doesn't have anything to do with public statements he's made like his actual it doesn't undercut anything that he said necessarily like it's just why why are we hearing this it just feels like dirty like I'm listening to gossip and I I hate that and I hate that the the New Yorker uh, has descended to this level though who knows how high they they've been <laughs> of late um, but yeah it's just just a whole weird situation, weird thing to, to go after Huberman in this way. It is. I'm like, okay, it's one thing if you write a whole article, like I said, about like Huberman is sponsored by AG1 Greens and he's like sharing this on every single podcast mm -hmm. and it turns out that AG1 Greens is not effective whatsoever. Oh, shoot, that's a hit piece. That's something that like, oh, let me, let me actually hear that out and see if there's something to it or, you know, his research isn't as valid as he, he makes it out to be or this expert who's been on his show has been discredited. Obviously, none of that was present in this article. But yeah, those are interesting things that I think actually impact the people who are listening to his podcast, not what he does in his personal life. Like, mind you, there are a ton of people who we go to for advice, wisdom, to help us with our lives, a ton of people who we respect, admire, whatever the case may be, who lead very abysmal personal lives that we would by no means, you know, want to be a part of or want to be privy to. That should not affect 
the way that you are viewed in in the work that you are doing unless that's coming to like interfere with your work in some way shape or form it just don't make sense to me i guess we'll see if he like responds to it there's several responses from a spokesperson who says you know these stories aren't true or they actually happened in a far different light or the ivf wasn't actually to have babies they just wanted to create embryos just in case all these different things um i don't know like what if i was him i would just be like you know uh, it depends it depends on how true some of this stuff is i would be like you know what does it have to do with my podcast what does it have to do with you listening i think taylor said i wouldn't he wouldn't even respond he just yeah. doesn't go silent i mean de depending on the merits of the claims and whether i thought they were actually relevant to like your credibility but right uh just real quick do you have anything to say to i've seen a couple comments to the effect of like why are you guys so intent on defending huberman are you just promoting his podcast you huberman fanboys like what's your response to this because i feel like it's more about the principle at hand right yeah i don't listen to huberman so i i've <laughs> i've listened to his morning routine and uh, like i said i've watched other youtubers implement his morning routine and i love the idea of going out and getting getting a sunlight or nothing. I didn't know virtually anything about this man other than the fact that he was uh, at Stanford and I got tickets to see his show in LA from a friend. So that's about all I knew about Homeboy. I don't feel any incessant need to defend him. If his research has been discredited or his podcast has been discredited, then by all means, let's have a discussion about why you shouldn't listen to Huberman Lab or, or like why it might not be the best implement information to implement in your life. We just didn't get this. And I want you all to think about, I don't know, anything in your life that has created drama in your personal life or a past relationship that didn't go so well. And then imagine a journalist finding that person you know, years into a separate success story that you're having where you're doing well in a career that has nothing to do with your relationship with that last person. And then a, a journalist just taking notes and publishing it to discredit what you're doing now. It's not OK. It doesn't make sense. I mean, we've seen this happen a ton. We at length covered the Russell Brand allegations on this show. And I said, as a fan of Russell Brand, some of these allegations sound credible and should be investigated. Now, the nature of the hit piece, I think, had a real big bend towards just bringing down Russell as somebody who speaks out against mainstream media and legacy media. And I think they wanted to take him down by any means necessary. But some of those allegations had were sounding a, a little credible and a little detailed and at least needed to be looked into to some extent, hopefully from law enforcement, not from from journalists. But this is just not checking out. I saw the thing like falling for Huberman, which is hilarious that this is the way that they marketed this falling for Huberman as if you, the audience member, is the one who's falling for the great Andrew Huberman, when in reality, they're talking about women that he slept with. That's nuts. Right. So there's some intentional ambiguity there to already kind of undermine his credibility just by the cover that they're putting on it. And I will say like one last thought on on his why we're defending him or whatever. Like it would be one thing if the nature of his podcast were that he was dispensing advice about relationships and portraying himself as like this monogamous person. And it was like sharing his opinions on how to have successful relationships, not because here's some research and here's a, a scientific researcher who has some thoughts on this, but here's my own opinion on how to manage successful relationships, how to be faithful, things like that. Mm -hmm. And if he was living in a way that was inconsistent in that, and that came to light, then yeah, I think that's relevant for the public to know because he he's being a hypocrite in that regard. But like we've said, uh, so far as I'm aware, I don't think that anything that's come to light really has anything to do with claims that he's made or things that he's represented on his show in particular. And that's why I think it's, it's not really fair game to go after his personal life when, uh, that's entirely separate from uh, what he's been using his public platform for. Yeah, and if this is true, I hope he don't get another girlfriend until he pulls his stuff together because apparently mm -hmm. he's out there playing in y'all's faces. <laughs> so he mm -hmm. needs to he needs to clean up his relationship act before he invests himself in another long term committed relationship. <laughs> Very clearly, he needs to add another minute to that daily ice bath or something. Yeah, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he's not getting the proper amount of dopamine, so he's finding it from other women. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let me stop. Uh, let me let me cut the jokes. Cut the jokes. Uh, cut the show. Um, yeah. No. So clearly, he has some work to do in his own personal endeavors. But again, does that have anything to do with the research? No, it doesn't. But also, 
did you help? How, how did these women not see it? He's like 48 years old. I think he's single with no kids. He's jacked and a, a workhorse. Did you think he was going to be Mr. Mr. Commitment? <laughs> Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, maybe he, of course, it seems like he lied to them. It does seem like he lied to them. But also, intuition is intuition is key. And they, the first girl, I don't know about the other girls. The first girl had several signs to get the hell out of there. And now is making an article for the New Yorker. So she needs to chill. And we're going to get into your super chats, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's the whole thing's like a women posting their L's almost. If you stuck with me through the story, you guys, uh, hopefully, hopefully this was interesting and we got through it. Like I said, we were going to do, we were going to react to Jubilee today and do the like queer in the closet versus queer out of the closet. And then this article popped up and I read through it and I just, I could sniff that something was afoot. Okay. There was a mystery afoot in this article and somebody was playing games. So we had to go through it today. I didn't do it full justice as I could have, you know, really broken down the story for you a little bit more, but it's all right. We got, we got what we needed. It's all right. And you know, it's, it was entertaining, not going to lie, but also made for an interesting conversation on the principles at hand and the purpose of media, the way that, you yep. know, they want to discredit him, things like that. So I think y'all got your, your time's worth out of this, even yeah. if it was a very like spurious uh, sort of piece. I'm trying to think so, like, well, what, what would my hit piece from the New Yorker be about? I'm really trying to dive deep here in my brain to think about what would my hit piece be when I figure it out I'll let you guys know I'll let I'll get ahead of the New Yorker and let you know about uh any any dubiousness in my personal life <laughs> well if y'all have any ideas too, drop them in the chat yeah. I'm still I was collecting some of y'all's jokes about things innocuous things that Huberman did that the New Yorker wouldn't like said he used the map instead of GPS <laughs> he does math with a pen uh he only uses a bidet he put pineapple on pizza and he sits in the front row at a movie theater. Dude, it's <laughs> hilarious. Like some of the things that they felt, you could tell that they didn't have enough to create an entire article. So they just had to like throw some pieces in there. Like he didn't make it to meet your parents on Thanksgiving. I'm sorry. That sucks. But also, why am I reading this right now? Very exactly. weird. Exactly. Weird behavior. All right, guys, your turn. We're going to read your super chats. Uh, First one from today is from BG, who says, love you guys. Love you both. Oh, appreciate that. Thank you. Great way to kick us off. Thank you. Yes, it is. Deport all 304s, which you can guess who that is, says, hey there, A and Tay. See, ladies, don't ever take advice from your single girlfriends. Misery loves company. They are trying to make you single as a cope. What? I think sometimes that's true, but not all the time. Uh, I've, I've gotten some amazing dating advice from single people that has uh, helped me along the way. So sometimes it's yeah. true. Sometimes it's not. Married people can say dumb things or smart things. Single mm-hmm. people can say mm-hmm. smart things or dumb things or wise things, I should say. One so hondo. the key is what's, what's wise? What does that look like? Uh, he goes on to say, RP advice for women. Don't date someone like Huberman. He may have money and status, but that doesn't make him a good guy. Take notes, ladies. Yeah, don't, don't yeah, after this, maybe don't date a Huberman. <laughs> yeah, but also you, there, he could have been a straight up, you know, straight we never guy, know. Like somebody who fits that mold. So, you know, you know you these girls know. could be crazy. You never, never leave out the opportunity, the, the possibility that uh, somebody is crazy and making up lies. Mm. Be a very good discerner of character. That's good advice, no matter mm-hmm. what type of guy, date, or girl. Uh, Otaku69 says, hey, I'm a lazing and straight edge tea. Hope <laughs> you're doing well. We are doing well. It's been a good Monday. Had a good weekend. Very chill vibes. Uh, now we're here with you today, so we're doing good. We're chill. Uh, Fun with Car says, maybe he cheated on his wife with the journalist. Uh, Amala, we love hearing your perspective. Much love from Buffalo, Niagara Falls, New York, USA. Oh, very, very cool. Yeah, who knows? There's a lot going on in this story. I mean, he yeah. He didn't have a wife, though, did he? Oh, no, yeah, I don't, I don't, think, he, I don't yeah. think he's been married. I, okay. At least, uh, not to my knowledge. They don't talk about it in the, in the article, so I, I actually have no clue. Maybe he has been married. All of you Huberman Lab followers, you can let me know uh, down below whether or not that is the case. But he just sounds like a bachelor which makes sense. If you're going to be a bachelor, 
just especially in his position just say you're a bachelor you're gonna find women who want to be with you and sleep with you regardless so i don't know why you would just not be 100 about that just be upfront about it in this day and age a lot of women don't care are you are you kidding yeah but sometimes i think you know you guys want to have their cake and eat it too and like playhouse and have the luxury of things mm-hmm. that come with the commitment without actually giving that exclusive commitment yeah but but nowadays you can get both yeah. please <laughs> just be honest be so for real right now. be so for real right now Celtic Blacksmith says, I heard that Becky passed a note to Anthony Huberman in homeroom and called him cute. So Sarah called Becky a bitch later under the bleachers. <laughs> uh, well done, Sarah. That's a good one. The messages in the girls' bathroom go so hard, you know, like when they write in Sharpie, watch out for this guy. And now they have like the Facebook message groups. The Huberman's all over that. He's all over mm-hmm. the bathroom walls. <laughs> Becky and Sarah both sent him a note that said circle yes or no if you want to date me and he said yes on both of them <laughs> crazy uh, and very appropriate for the type of uh, capturing the sentiment yeah. of this article mm-hmm. uh, drama f- forever says it's giving the movie the uh, the other woman plot line oh Haven't yes seen I've seen that movie that's with like uh, oh my gosh Cameron Diaz and oh my gosh who else is in that the guy from Game of Thrones it's a good it's a classic rom com cheat cheat film if you guys like like an early 2000s style oh, rom-com <laughs> the other <laughs> woman's a good one uh let's see to port all 304s is going off today says this is for the lonely guys looks maxing absolutely works i went out this weekend the first girl i asked to dance said yes plus she was hot and i got her number telling you kings you can do it <laughs> Alex stays repping for looks maxing in the super chats. You know what? I'm all here for it. If it gets you like eating healthy and going to the gym and, you know, I'd argue that it might not be, you know, the best motivator. You should just want to do that. But like, you know what? If that helps, I'm on a looks maxing journey right now. I'm going to Hawaii in a month. So I'm like hitting the gym every day until the month is up. So I'm, I'm, I'm looks maxing with you guys. <laughs> we'll see if it shows on the on the stream. Yeah, well, we're we're happy for your success, Alex. He's uh, gone through the just put me in the matrix already. Give me the Apple Vision Pro. I'm yep. just going to have AI girlfriends to now having the best night of his life this past weekend. There so you go. Get get the girl's number, it, Alex. <laughs> um, a couple more, actually, from our friend Alex says, okay. you know, I'm not going to lie. This is a great RP episode for women that I didn't know we were going to get today. Take notes, women, part one, part two. That is a huge red flag, DEFCON 5. Make sure you don't join the stable of 304s. If you don't evolve your standards, you will get left behind. Yeah, you have to you have to keep an eye on these things. I think a lot of women's stakes are like, okay, I, I would imagine their thinking is this guy's on the come up, he's really smart, he's really cool. I don't want to lose this like gem because he's like famous and other people see the value in him, so they they put up with stuff that you wouldn't typically put up with uh, in in a relationship. But it's not worth it. Choose happiness. Choose happy. Choose peace. <laughs> mm, well, not yeah. treachery. Some things should be non negotiables and don't. Yep break your non-negotiables for someone just because they're they're a little more attractive, they're a little more successful, they're a little more rich, mm-hmm. or whatever. Like that's that's a test of your character at that point. You already know their character. You see the signs and you don't you yep. don't take those red flags into account. That's on you. You don't need point. it. Uh V says Amla, your hit piece would be Amla Epinobi wasn't a leftist. What other things is she lying about? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> they could try to expose me, but I got the receipts on that. So well, we've, we've played the receipts on this show. You've seen my left leaning speech, but it was just a psyop. I pretended to be a leftist for the purpose of grifting to the right. <laughs> you started planning it with a tattoo when you were 16. Yep. I started planning it at 16 years old. Uh, and then from there, it's just all I've been playing chess, not checkers this whole time. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> Busted. Savvy C says, first time catching a live, finally. And I'm having a blast in the chat. We all know Huberman leaves his crusty socks on the floor. Oh, no. What a strange <laughs> live to catch for the first time. <laughs> Knowing yeah, this how was this... A, definitely a different one. <laughs> this is definitely a different one. I'm curious how the, I think the Huberman fans are going to find this in post once the live is done. And they're going to have much to say. I'll be curious to hear what their, what their take is on Homeboy Huberman. 
Yeah, leave them in the chat. I've listened to a handful of uh, Huberman episodes, and it's usually like how to maximize your testosterone yeah. or you know things like that. And it's it's a, it's good times. But uh, listened, yeah, if you guys get a hold of this later, let us know what you thought in the comments. Yeah, I've listened to. I think he did one on cold plunges, or maybe he did like a Rogan interview on cold plunges. It was either Rogan or Chris Williamson, something about that. And then uh, what was another one? Alcohol which will oh, yeah. scare the daylights out of you when it comes to drinking alcohol. Um, yeah. What else? His morning routine. And yeah, that's it. And then that talk in, in LA, which was boring, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, guys. But it was his first show, so maybe they kind of made it better with time. It's like comedy. You know, you got to refine the routine mm -hmm. a little bit, mm -hmm. just like his morning routine has to be refined. Yep. Has been. But yeah, I think that was actually our last super chat. So we made it through. All today. right, guys. Hopefully you had a good time today. Let me know how you felt in the comments down below. If you're a Huberman fan, let me know. Did this change the trajectory of your uh, fan ness towards <laughs> towards Andrew Huberman? Drop it down below. Give me your thoughts. Is this uh, an actual good hit piece? Is it a bad hit piece? What what would your hit piece be about if the New Yorker wrote one about you? Drop it down below so that you can air out your dirty laundry before they do. I'll be very curious to read some of those. And guys, thank you so much for watching the show today. Hope you have a good one and I will see you tomorrow in a video about girls who are now flirting with chat GPT through voice chat. It's very real. He does flirt back uh, and it's weird. So keep an eye out for that. And I did it myself. So you get to watch me chat to the GT chat GPT voice chat and it gets weird almost immediately. So <laughs> with that, have a fantastic rest of your Monday and I'll see you next time. Bye, guys.